Um, my name is Matt Bonds. I'm a professor at Harvard Medical School and a founder of the um, non-governmental organization called Pivot. We work in Madagascar. And I was wondering if we could ask people to take my badge. Um, if people would like to come up closer to here, that'd be great. It's no pressure. We were warned that it'd be a much more enjoyable experience for everyone if we could see you. So uh, today we're talking about healthcare in Africa, blending the old with the new. We have um, a lovely set of panelists. We have um, Patrick Beatty from Redbird, uh, Diane Kane from Medic Mobile, and Jacob Zanu from, from Z Valley. Um, I was asked, I'm, I'm, I'm also a panelist, I was also asked uh, to be a moderator. We, had, we lost our moderator on short notice. I don't know if anyone saw that, um, Dr. Agnes Benaguajo was originally on the, on the panel, and she's one of my heroes, and I, I'm, I assume an attraction for a lot of people, but um, she had a little bit of a, a travel situation, so unfortunately she's not gonna be here. So um, it's fine, I think I, every, I, everything I know about global health and health in Africa I learned from her, so I think I can try to channel some of, some of her energy. Um, so I was asked to, uh, to, to frame this conversation around um, broadly, uh, the landscape of health in Africa, which is kind of an impossible thing to do, as you can imagine. For one, Africa isn't a, pop a single population, obviously. It's not a country, and it's quite, it's famously heterogeneous. Um, some of you may know that there's more genetic diversity in Africa than the rest of the world combined. There's hundreds of individual languages, huge economic diversity as well, and so it'd be kind of crazy for us to try to um, to overly uh, simplify what it means to do healthcare in Africa, but but there are common problems uh, across the continent, and that that those of us who who work in that space see in a lot of different countries. And so I thought I would just start by framing some of them, and uh, as a way for introducing uh, the rest of our panel. So uh, I understand there's a pretty broad audience, so I'll do my best to um, to start uh, at the most basic level, I guess. So most of you know that, that uh, around the turn of the millennium, we established the Millennium Development Goals with um, pretty ambitious targets of dropping under five mortality by 50%, dropping maternal mortality by two thirds, <clears throat> and along with a lot of other health related and development related objectives. And at that time, the world was actually starting to feel pretty optimistic, although issues like HIV um, pandemic were looming extremely heavily. And so there was a huge um, burst of uh, goodwill, international will, um, the n n development assistance for health increased by seven times. Now uh, there's about $32 billion in development assistance for health internationally. Most of that money is actually in Africa. Africa receives uh, more than uh, almost all other regions in the world combined for that. And so, and we saw progress. I don't know if people are tracking that, but life expectancy has increased by about 10 years in Africa since the, the turn of the millennium. HIV rates are, have decreased by 50% uh, in, in terms of mortality. Uh, and almost every indicator that any of us care about, things like under five mortality, maternal mortality, coverage rates, immunization rates, all those are enjoying some level of a, a meaningful systematic progress as part of general economic development and investment in health. So that's the good news. <clears throat> um, the bad news is uh, it ain't uh, good enough, and we're not there yet. Almost no country's actually accomplished the Millennium Development Goals. I believe that the country of Rwanda is the only one to achieve those Millennium Development Goals. Um, coverage rates. Uh, the ability for children to get access to, for treatments of very simple illness like fever, diarrhea, pneumonia, those are less than half for the country. Under five mortality is about, across the con continent, about 8%, um, which is uh, significantly greater than any other, other region in the world. Maternal mortality is 10 times what it is in most other parts of the world. So there are huge problems. <coughs> uh, 
and their thorny problems, and that some of these problems are starting to, to, to not go away at all. We see some level of resurgence of malaria. We see vaccination rates not uh, improving in many parts of the continent. And so there's like all these, so even as we're seeing progress, we're like seeing um, real hard challenges. And maybe to just name a few uh, that have, get a lot of headlines, the Ebola outbreak uh, on top of normal chronic issues is obviously a no joke situation of very infectious uh, disease that uh, destabilizes entire governments. I work in Madagascar. Last year we had the biggest plague epidemic in 50 years <clears throat> and um, uh, we actually had the case of the pneumonic plague, so that's spreading airborne, it killed people within two days. Classic story of, um, of a global uh, threat um, invading population centers. And so the question that, that, the way that I think about these kinds of problems, and I believe some of the panelists share this view is, What's the deal there? Like, why do, why, why do we have these persistent problems and new kinds of problems? Plague, many of you probably know that plague is, um, plague is a medieval disease, but it's actually a very wimpy disease. It's a bacterial infection that actually responds to most um, antibiotics. Um, very few are actually resistant. It's almost 100% curable for, for almost nothing. And so we see in places like Madagascar, uh, 20, 30, 40,000 children under five die of even more common illness for things that are just as easily treatable. So, um, so those are the kinds of problems we'd like to solve. And so I, today we'd like, I'd like to pose these kinds of questions of the, like how do we actually, what, why do these problems persist? Why couldn't we accomplish the goals that we set even as the world was uh, rallying resources about around them? What does the modern world offer for a continent like Africa where technology we have at our fingertips, lots of people have smartphones, they're actually in the hands of community health workers and actually individuals. We have access to data that we've never had before uh, and obviously we're seeing broad-based, um, slow, uh, uncertain economic development. <clears throat> so. Um, I will hand it over to the group um, to start posing these questions, what's the future of healthcare and health access in Africa? Before I do that, I'll start by taking off my, mo my moderator framing hat and um, put on my panelist hat. So <clears throat> I mentioned that I work with an organization called Pivot. I'm one of the founders. We, we believe that uh, one of the major problems in all these things is, is, is that systems, health systems, uh, geographically defined systems of hospitals, health centers, uh, supply chains uh, are broken. And so sim even the simplest of solutions, even anti-malarial drugs or antibiotics have trouble, even when they work amazingly well, have trouble giving to the individuals who need them. And so we as an organization have, have created a model system at the level of a government district that works at hospitals, health centers, and community health workers. And uh, we build infrastructure, supply chains, at all levels of that system, we do the trainings and the human resource development, and then we, um, in particular, invest uh, quite a lot in data so that we can understand whether we're seeing change, whether we're having impact, why that's happening, and then identify programs that can scale across this country. So our, our, our problem, we see, is broken systems. Our solution is a model system for healthcare in Madagascar. So um, with that, I'll hand it over to Jacob to introduce. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Jacob Zanu. I'm a research nurse here at Kaiser Auckland, and uh, I'm from Benin Republic, West Africa. Uh, I've, educated, I've been educating the system over there before I got here. Uh, and uh, uh, I'd like to start it with uh, uh, the phrase you just used you know, earlier. So he's talking about health, health system, and that's my passion. Because uh, my uh, approach of the health system growing in Benin, being in Benin every three months for the last decade or so is completely different. The way I see things is completely different. Uh, the World Health Organization have been saying the same thing and over and over. Health system, there are four key pillars. There are main pillars to a health system when at the country level. Number one, health infrastructure. It's basic. How do you convey that vaccine to my, the kids in my village, Hosi, if you don't have a small infrastructure over there. Health infrastructure, whether it's in public sector or in the private sector, you can check and see. We're talking about five beds per 10,000 population in Benin. 
four beds per 10,000 population in Burkina Faso. Three beds per 10,000 population in Niger, and so on and so on. So this is SOCAP. So I believe maybe there are some investors here. So you see there are room here to invest if you want to put, put health facilities. That's number one. Human resources for health. Doctors, nurses, midwife. I've discovered something extraordinary here in the United States. They call them technician, EKG technician, cardiac, echocardiac technician. We don't have that in the French system. So if you want to invest and make money, why don't you put a school over there and train this? Because we need those. We have less than one doctor per, ten, per 1,000 population. So that's the second pillar, human resources for health. And then talking about uh, health information technology, put some software. Electronic, we have uh, email, electronic healthcare record system that we can use. So whether it's in the public or a private sector, there's room for investment. And then I'm telling you, Africa is uh, the lens of opportunity. The land of opportunity because you have the human resources that just waiting for training. If you can put right there the schools, the institute to train them, and then you put the healthcare facilities, and then we have a system that can work because the problem that we have so far is to have a basic system that can a system that can com convey basic healthcare services. We don't have that, and governments talking about government. I can speak to Benin. Five years ago, we were able to raise half a million dollars and put a 20-bed hospital in Benin. The government is changing the rules now in a way that help investors make money. So that is very attractive for investors because they are changing the rules. They are making it very, very attractive for investors to come and invest. So there are room for... Uh, uh, you know, if you want to make money, this is, this is the time. This is the time because I think the investors that are going to position themselves, themselves right now will be the leaders of tomorrow, whether it's healthcare in West Africa or all over Africa. And especially French-speaking Africa. It's very important because most of the funding that are going to Africa, I'm not saying that the English-speaking countries don't need resources. We all as Africa need resources. But if you see the gap between the French-speaking countries and English-speaking countries, it's huge. So they are, I say, wherever there are needs, they are profit to be made. So the needs should be seen as a basket of opportunities. So whether it's in the private sector or in the public sector, I can speak to both because I'm, you know, when you're in the private sector, you have to talk, you have to work with the government, you know, regulation side, so they come in and see everything. And then there's opportunity to transfer skills that we have here that we don't have back home. So there are plenty of room over there where we can invest and make money and save lives. So that's going to be my, my uh, message as of now. Thank you. Let me just do one quick follow-up question on this one. Just before we move on, can you just talk a little bit about the Z Valley model? <laughs> so what we're trying to do technically is, um, uh, I don't know how well you are aware of the Kaiser uh, system. I work at Kaiser and I love Kaiser. This is, I, I don't know, I'm passionate about Kaiser. So we put that 20-bed hospital, Kaiser step, Kaiser Oakland, where I work, step in and equip that. So after five years, so what we see now, I'm like, okay, let's get this to... Uh, Let's scale this up like seriously, serious investment, where we have great hospital, we have a hospital. So when you have a hospital, then we will have institute to train. Kaiser also have, you know, uh, they train the uh, EKG tech, they train the uh, cardiac echo tech. So I want to build the next Kaiser system for Africa. That's, that's what I want. And the system, it's a blend of for-profit and non-profit. I think uh, the, the most, uh, the, the infrastructure sites, drain more non-profit, and then the operation side drain is it's mainly run for profit. So we, we can have a blend that will fit to uh, kind of capture resources and put what we need to build a health system in West Africa, in all Africa, starting from Benin, and also more importantly, call in the government to show them the way to do things 
Me give you an, keep, uh, give you a simple example. In uh, uh, beginning ne next year, we're going with a team of OBGYN from Kaiser Oakland to start a diagnostic capability for women cancer. So diagnostic, basic diagnostic capability, and then from there, the protocol for treatment. Then that, the, 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 the structure we have right now in Benin, it's called Polyclinic St. Anne, will be used as a center of ex excellence. Then we call in the government and show them, and then that can be replicated and scaled at the national level. But I'm thinking bigger than that. Let's get investors together, build something nice, and then have all the components, since we already have the human resources here, helping us at Kaiser, from Kaiser Oakland. So that's what it is. Um, so we'll go to Diane. Um, so I'm Diana Kane. I'm the Chief Design Officer at Medic Mobile. Um, Medic Mobile is a nonprofit uh, organization that builds open source software for community health systems. So we work with organizations like MATS, um, Pivot, um, as well as others that are building new models of community health delivery um, in the hardest to reach parts of the world. Um, so our primary users of our software are community health workers, and if you're new to global health, um, a community health worker is um, oftentimes a volunteer, uh, though in some models we're increasingly seeing um, payment and professionalization of them as a service, um, but they're often nominated by their communities in remote villages um, as oftentimes women who have demonstrated a commitment to their community and a passion for the health of their community. Um, and they're given um, you know, anywhere from two weeks to a year's worth of training, depending on the infrastructure and the model that's, that's in place. Um, and they're delivering services door to door. So they're, um, all the families in their vicinity, uh, they're showing up at their house, they're seeing if there are any sick children, they are sometimes providing some over-the-counter medicines uh, at the door, some basic diagnostics, again, depending on the, the support that's provided by the organization. Um, an organization like Pivot is training and providing a very high level of service there. Um, many ministries of health also have community health worker programs, again, to varying degrees of uh, of service provided. Um, those health workers are also accompanying patients to primary care facilities and are really the linkage between uh, the community and the health system, oftentimes the only linkage that a family ever receives. So the software that Medic Mobile uh, designs and, and builds is uh, designed to support and um, enhance what those community health workers are able to provide. So we have the ability for uh, the health worker to register every family that they're caring for into an offline app that's on their phone. And so they're able to scroll through that list and see which families they have visited recently and, and who they haven't. And they're able to receive reminders about children that need a follow-up after a clinic visit um, or need to be referred for their next round of immunizations. So it really keeps people from falling through the cracks and it also provides uh, decision support and algorithms for those health workers to ensure that they're providing a consistent level of care um, across, um, again, different levels of, of training um, that's provided to them. So I've been with the organization um, coming up on seven years now. We're about 10 years old. And uh, our staff, we're 100 people um, spread across the world. San Francisco is by far our smallest office. Um, we've got 40-some people in Nairobi now, another 20-some in Kathmandu, um, other remote offices in Kampala and Dakar, um, and then quite a large remote team of developers. So um, my background is in uh, public health and sociology and anthropology, and I lead the design team with a specific focus on designing with the health workers that we serve. Um, so I bring in a lot of human-centered design principles and methodologies. Um, and I'm happy to share more about all of that, too. Great. I have just a quick follow-up question. So um, mobile, mobile technologies are, uh, are ex extremely exciting in the world in general and in, in the health space in particular. Um, there are a number of organizations that are emerging around getting community health workers mobile technologies to help support their work. Could you just say a few more words about... Um, what's different about Medic Mobile, the principles with which it operates? Yeah, sure. 
Um, I think being open source is, it's always been a really important core part of our mission um, and being nonprofit as well. Um, uh, so we uh, have no user fees, there's no uh, uh, contract fees, service agreement fees that um, would be a barrier to a Ministry of Health adopting these tools long term. Um, it's really part of our model uh, to be working with organizations uh, like Pivot and others to uh, embed these tools and, and show that a new way of delivering care is possible and then to have governments pick that up. And so we've, we're doing everything we can to eliminate the barriers to governments taking on a system like this and operating it long term. Um, I think also the commitment to designing with the user is an important differentiator for us. Um, uh, you know, we really, we, we see ourselves as walking hand in hand with users and understanding the processes that they go through on a daily basis and that drives our roadmap and our feature requests. Um, so this isn't a kind of uh, quick and one and done type of uh, engagement. We're not a typical um, technical consulting company that will come in and design and deliver a solution. We really work with organizations for the long term and are continuing to evolve the toolkit alongside them. Yeah, it's a, it's a tech company that's driven by social scientists and socially okay. minded folks. Okay, great, thanks. Patrick. Hi everyone, I am Patrick. I am one third of Redbird which is a, a for-profit Ghanaian startup in digital health. At Redbird, what we do is we are a lab-in-a-box solution for convenient healthcare via pharmacies. So we see a complete lack of convenient options for the most basic screening or monitoring information you might want to get. Right now, uh, in Ghana, where we are headquartered, we have Diabetes exploding, growing at almost four times the rate it's growing in the US. And that's a very different need on a patient side. You need to therefore be monitoring your health over time. And right now, your only real option if you wanna get a checkup is to go into a hospital and wait in line with everyone else and spend about half your day. Now that's not gonna happen. And so what we're trying to do is create a network of convenient places where people can get these health checkups. And we do it by leveraging existing pharmacies and providing them with a two-part solution. One is the rapid diagnostic technology to perform these tests. This is already existing approved diagnostic technology. And the other is our health monitoring software to help them track patients so patients can get their results over time and not just one-off results so they can transform into managing their health. We sometimes get asked why we focus on emerging markets because uh, we're actually a US incorporated company although we work mainly in Ghana. And it's two main reasons uh, and I think this is important for the investor side of this discussion. It's growth and opportunity. There's huge growth happening in the population that we serve. I mean, obviously on the disease side when we look to the future, chronic disease is exploding. It is going to be the future of disease all over the world. But in addition to that, we also have the fastest growing middle class. And so we have a lot of opportunity of people that are coming into being able to pay for better healthcare, being able to pay for better education and things like this. Now, we also see huge opportunity. We have a greenfield space, and I think this is a, a leapfrog opportunity, if you will, in that disease is becoming much like the rest of the world, but we're not burdened by existing infrastructure that was developed in a pre-digital age. So we can look at how can we develop a healthcare system that fully utilizes digital technology and create something that's much better than anything we have anywhere else. And that's really what we're trying to do at Redbird is create this network of convenient health points that has digital technology as a backbone so that we can create a system that is unlike anything you see in the world, much better, much more convenient for patients, but also now can do much more because we don't have all of these entrenched interests that we have to fight against. And so that's what really gets us excited. And to me, it's not a question of why would you invest in emerging market healthcare? It's why would you invest anywhere else? This is the place where you can create something unique. Thanks. Thanks. 
Um, I have a couple follow-up questions. So in case it's not uh, abundantly clear, um, Medic Mobile and Pivot are non-governmental organizations. Um, if you give us money, we're not going to give it back. We probably won't give it back. Um, so, um, uh, and we operate, our consumers are the extreme poor. Uh, and um, Redbird and Z Valley are, 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 are going in the for-profit space. And if you give them money, they're, gonna, they're hoping to give it back to you. Um, so there's a, we're in different, completely different markets. So one thing that's um, in different kinds of problems, but one thing that is conspicuously similar, and um, given how, how widely different our markets are, are uh, I would say that we're all um, totally obsessed with data. And we see that as um, not, um, not the end goal, but a really powerful tool, and we collect data in different ways, and uh, we, we are constantly envisioning a future for how that data becomes our friend really fast and helps us make decisions at, at the individual um, caregiver level on up to the systems and supply chains and um, strategy level. And so I just, I just have a question for, for Redbird. Um, so, uh, so just to, to summarize, what you're describing is a lab in a box where you have all the diagnostic tools at a, at a private pharmacy. Those, those treatments tend not to be overly expensive, and then you have software that, that help people monitor their health, make decisions, and you're forming a big uh, network of information. And I'm just like, if you were to dream a little bit, but not too much, like uh, predict uh, aspirationally, in five, in five years, what, how, are that, how is that data actually being used to, like, to solve these problems? A great question, um, and, and something we think a lot about. And I think what, what we focus on at Redbird with, with our strategy is uh, we see this big-term vision that we want to get to where all the potential that you can get from data. Um, and this is our way, our lab in a box, is one of the ways that you start creating the groundwork for that because you have to, you have to develop that network so that you're um, generating the data to where it gets useful. And when I look into the future and envision a place where we have been successful and, and we're you know, getting a real-time database of not just disease prevalence, not just how people uh, are managing their disease on a test side, but also potentially you know, how people are trying to improve their health, your, you know, your exercise regimen, things like this. Everything that's involved in health, because health is actually holistic. Um, what I see then is a potential to use all of that information in a way that informs care and starts evolving how care is done. You know, we don't want to go in and say we should be completely changing how care is being done now. We want to learn through the data that we generate and start getting to a point where the data that you're generating on a daily basis is informing the health policy decisions that are being decided and how we shift how things are viewed on a safety and regulatory standpoint to where you get in a point where you're constantly, you're creating this flywheel of constant learning and evolution on how healthcare is provided, what's viewed as uh, safe and, and what's viewed as best practice. And uh, that's where I think we want to get when we think of how can you take uh, a seemingly small step of starting to collect data and, and network that between everyone and create real uh, incredible systems change. Um, I'll, I'd like to follow that exact question up with Diana. So, um, so the medic mobile technology is it's basically decision support. It's the decision support in a sense is data driven in the sense that it's based on evidence and WHO guidelines, et cetera, of uh, how healthcare workers are supposed to respond to a particular set of diagnostic signals. Um, and, and we're, we are, we're all still in the space of, of when do the data start fundamentally changing the way we do our work. And um, I'm curious where, what you think the answer is for Medic in terms of how the data are, are going to be used in the coming years to, imp to improve and scale and, and be used in real time. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, so. I'll start with how it's being used already right now, uh, which is, and, and to make the distinction between mobile technology being used as a data collection tool and data as a byproduct of all of these other work support tools. And so that's really how we see data first and foremost, which I think is an important 
statement um, is that often people come looking to go into remote communities to just extract data, and that's uh, a very short-term type of intervention. Uh, so, you know, rather we're embedding our tools into the way health workers are working and using the data that naturally comes from that, that's um, naturally comes from being in service to the health workers to better understand uh, the situations of the communities that they're serving. So already we're making use of the data that's being collected uh, to uh, inform supervision dashboards and Ministry of Health um, impact indicators um, that uh, enables um, primary care district level managers in health systems to make faster and more informed decisions um, about the communities that they're serving. So this is not only about designing technology tools, it's actually redesigning entire systems who just never before had, had response systems in place because they've never had access to data so quickly. Um, you know, a, a paper data system, you'd be lucky if you knew about an outbreak three months after it started. And we're able to do much more um, real-time um, outbreak surveillance and response systems that have actually redefined even power dynamics and uh, roles within healthcare systems. So, um, you know, Medic has been a partner in reimagining what those systems and who needs to be in place in order to do that. Um, it's also increasing the ability uh, for supervisors to better manage these cadres of community health workers and nurses at primary care facilities because you're able to see uh, who's delivering care, uh, you know, for what diagnoses and um, which health workers have higher levels of burden in certain communities and how we can better resource uh, the, uh, the distribution of health workers across communities. Um, so that's already, being ha that's already happening now. Um, and then we're, we're already um, really hands-on and deep in the process of starting to build data algorithms um, and predictive algorithms to better identify which children are more likely to have malaria based on uh, you know, various aspects around where they live, around their, uh, the wealth quintile of their family. Um, so we're building models in that in the very near future are going to be informing uh, the types of suggestions we make to community health workers um, so that they can better manage their day and, and serve the communities um, targeting the families that are most likely to be in need. Right. Um, can, sorry, can I please. piggyback on that a little yeah. bit? Just, um, I really like some of the stuff you said, and one of the things that I, I heard a while ago um, that has always stuck with me was, uh, and I didn't realize this, but hurricanes, we all think of them as you know, something you, you see coming. That's a somewhat recent development. And the reason that we can track hurricanes and we know, you know, the strength and all this, and we actually know kind of where they're forming from the very start of when they formed is because uh, we've invested a lot in weather in distributed uh, sensors all around the world that's constantly monitoring and analyzing. And it's a very similar concept that you can start thinking about when you get into better data collection and also distributed diagnostics of why are pandemics something that surprise us. You know, we should be able to tell just like hurricanes from the very start before something even takes off and therefore be able to address it. And I think that's, you know, part of what you were talking about there, which becomes very powerful in the, the concept that within our lifetime, pandemics are viewed as something that uh, is, should not be catching us by surprise. Maybe they still happen, but um, at a much different scale, uh, really, I think is an incredible potential on this side. Yeah, um, speaking uh, about um, e-health, uh, my approach is kind of, will be a little different because, uh, you know, forgive me when I already see things a little bit from my uh, cultural African, you know, point of view. Um, I see uh, my, uh, my friend's approach as more likely uh, from, like, like uh, companies, you know, uh, uh, coming to uh, address some health issues and gathering data, and then so I was like, okay, this is extraordinary. This is great. What's happening? Because we have huge problem in healthcare. They are tackling different aspects of the problem. How can we do it at a national level? 
how can, I was talking uh, earlier about uh, putting in place, for example, a Kaiser approach, but in a hospital, everything is run on software. Why can't we, for example, develop a national software because the argument that, oh, it's going to be too expensive, it's going to be too complicated, it's, it's not possible. Th that argument doesn't stand anymore. So how, how can we do, we put in place uh, uh, an EMR, a national EMR, and have the government in a public-private public partnership get on board and do something like that. That would be amazing. That would be amazing because we can factor all, you know, all these uh, small uh, uh, experiments that, that are done because it is important to have uh, the systemic view of it so that we don't replicate uh, a, a failed approach like uh, the Haiti approach where you have the entire country run by different uh, for-profit, non-profit organizations. And, and you know, we all know that we're in the public health sector. So I still strongly believe in the role of government uh, even though we need to help them, uh, we need to accompany them as a company in a public-private relation to show them you know, uh, the right way to do things. Because everything we're doing here, data is key. Data is, is, is it all. You know, it's going to come to data. And then 10, 15 years from now, it's going to be like, okay, wait a minute. Okay, whatever data you're collecting from my country, how are you monetizing that? Okay, you see? So smart investors from now that get into PPP, public-private partnership with our government can be advised enough to position themselves as, uh, you know, the, the, like, it's so cap, right? Bring a meaning to money. So that's exactly my, my point of view. Yeah. I have, like, one follow-up on this theme. Um, so one of Pivot's um, core businesses is, is collecting and analyzing data to help us do a better job of what we do. And increasingly... Um, or that those data are telling a story that we weren't aware of when we started the organization. So we work in a district health system with 200,000 people, and we do it, the infrastructure and human resource support, supply chain stuff. We um, have a system where we partner with the government to actually eliminate user fees to the extreme poor, which is almost the entire population in this particular district. Uh, and even then, even then, um, there's a really fast drop off uh, of people who are able to access health centers based on geographic proximity. So folks who, who live within half a kilometer from a health center come about three times per year. Folks who live uh, five kilometers from a health center come every, once every two years. Not good enough in a, in a population where uh, one out of seven children die before they're five years old from common illness. So it's kind of a, that's a mystery, right? Why, would, why, do, why do people who, um, who sh whose children have a, uh, a fatal illness um, uh, take such a long time or not, not get care, even when it's five kilometers of away. And, uh, and, then the, and the question is, what can you do about it? And the solution to that, one solution to that, is, um, is taking things to the community level, community health workers. And the tradition of community health workers in the world is pretty, it's pretty narrowly defined, which is mostly around treating children who are under five for malaria, diarrhea, pneumonia, and, um, and some maternal health programs. That's generally the platform. There's some other programs that are done. Uh, and so the question that we can start answering now that I don't, do not feel like we had the capability of answering very well, uh, very, uh, not that long ago, is, well, how much more can the community health workers can do? Can you, can you give them a lab in a box? You know, uh, so that um, so that they can do good diagnostics and good, re reasonable treatment. That they're 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 offered tools. You know, often they're not particularly well educated. They're they're literate, but not, they're not professional clinicians. And can they be? Can modern technology give them the tools to expand the quality of services, the quality and quantity of services that they can do in remote areas, so seven-year-olds aren't dying of malaria? Um, and can the data through uh, these kinds of technologies evaluate whether that's actually working, whether they're getting better care than they would have otherwise? So to me, it does seem like there's a lot of talk about these potential rev revolutions in M health and digital health, and I haven't seen it to my satisfaction yet, but um, in terms of like really showing much better care, uh, but it does feel like for the first time that that is actually around the corner, I would say, yeah. Yeah, and th same principles. You have yeah, some questions. Yeah.
you say the name of the, com the organization company? Uh, the, 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 Uh, Alice Liu with, uh, why should I stand up, with Empowering Frontline Health Workers. And I wanted to respond to actually several things. I'll, I know we, um, I'll try and keep it short because I want others to speak. Uh, so for Jacob Zanu's comments, um, I totally agree with you. One of the things that we're, that, that we're uh, approaching it is um, our initiative is, is a public-private partnership with donor funds, private sector. Um, primarily our donor funds are, US, are from USAID, but... Um, we are working closely with the governments to try and uh, support government ownership of the open source um, health worker training platform that we've, uh, that we've implemented and um, empowering their partners to implement. And, and um, I think to get to your point about really looking at the issue systemically, um, there is a lot of work going on in the global digital health space, if, if anyone is not as familiar with it, in terms of um, uh, developing uh, national e-health strategies, national e-health architectures, um, establishing uh, interoperability standards. So going forward, when we think of blending old with the new, I think we'll have this ecosystem that's always going to be a mix of public and private. But as long as we have these um, architectures and interoperability standards in place, everyone can do what they think is the right approach for them. And but play together so that the data can be exchanged so that ultimately, at the national level, the governments will have the data they need to make policy decisions, resource allocation decisions, and so forth. Um, one other thing I wanted to add is maybe just stretch beyond where we are, because I've been in this space for a long time, so I know that we're not going to stay with paper and pen. We are definitely <laughs> going to keep marching forward with digital health. It's going to have the impact, um, even if maybe there's still some questions about it. Um, I'm thinking about have we combined this discussion with climate change? Um, and I think of the opportunities to look at climate change data and kind of predict the pandemics or the um, impacts to health. If uh, you know we're seeing drought in an area, there's going to be hunger. It's going to be malnutrition. Um, and you know we see the uh, her uh, terrible hurricanes or floods. We're going to see uh, disease coming out of the, you know, the, the, the dirty water that's flowing through. So I'm just wondering if anyone's really kind of looking uh, a little bit further out. I can respond to that. So we are, we are, we're starting, I, um, I have like a couple different tra trainings and one of them is as an economist, but the other is as an ecologist, a disease ecologist. And so um, what we're doing right now with our data systems is we are, we've mapped our entire district and um, we know every footpath in the whole district. Uh, we've partnered with um, OpenStreetMap actually to identify the exact walking time it takes to get from one place to another. And so we are going big on geographic information systems so that we know who's getting care, who's not getting care, where they are. And we are right this very moment overlaying that with um, environmental data, satellite imagery on land use, uh, and, and climate and seasonal climate change, not long-term climate change, but weather patterns. And uh, we're using those data to both model the dynamics of malaria, so that's like classic epidemiological modeling, is like in some ways it's kind of straightforward to do, um, which are obviously happening seasonally uh, in a place like Madagascar, uh, and, um, and also model the role of those geographic phenomena, these, environmental phenomena on people's access. So what happens in cyclone seasons or the wind rivers are going up and down. And so we, the reason why we're doing that is because malaria is a big problem, but it's also because we run into stockouts and we get really upset with ourselves uh, that, that malaria is surprising us sometimes because it might just come a little bit earlier uh, one year. Uh, we do see increasing like cyclone issues and weather patterns that are a little uncommon where we work in Madagascar. And so we are, um, we're actually uh, going uh, aggressively at that to use the most information that we could possibly have to get exactly when the malaria is hitting so we can anticipate when our stockets are. And so we're hoping to put that into our dashboard. We haven't done it yet, but in the next like year and a half or so.
That's okay. Hi, my name is Ronnie Dutt, and um, I'd like to speak to the gentleman who was speaking about Africa and the work in collaboration with governments. I think that uh, to strengthen the capacity at the government level is critical to scale uh, and to, to genuinely improve the overall condition of healthcare in those countries. Uh, when I was at Japigo, I was capturing uh, data from 40 different countries across 100 projects. And what we don't want to do is build parallel systems. So we need um, pub definitely pu public-private partnership, and, and you definitely need governments to be willing to scale up and use the newer technologies that are available. Um, so I would really like to hear from more people in the audience about uh, that sort of collaboration, because I think, I think that having uh, great pilot projects is excellent, but until it scales within a country, you're not going to you're not going to see the impact. Um, so it would be I don't know if there are uh, investors or funders, but I think that is the way to proceed in in the future. Of course, there are dangers with the government as they monitor and manage the information. So we and so there is there is a critical need to have the voice of the NGO community also in in, in the space. Um, but I'll, I'll comment that if for the, what it's worth, we. Um, we work exclusively with the government. So we work in the government, Ministry of Health Hospital, health, health centers, even the community health workers are technically part of the Ministry of Health and the information systems that, that I'm talking about right, right now are actually um, government information systems. Uh, did you guys want to... I can speak briefly to that as well. Um, we have national level government strategies with both Kenya and Nepal and signed agreements with both countries. And both of those healthcare systems are decentralized. And so it involves us going door to door, district to district, um, creating relationships with those district health officials, which we're doing in both countries. We're close to a dozen in Nepal and um, are making really good progress in Kenya, including having one district who has stepped up to be the model district for the rest of the country and are taking um, you know, amazing leadership and pride in being the first district to really go digital and design with us as a model building partner. Um, and so that's really exciting. We have a few other countries that are you know, active conversations right now and are in the works, but that's definitely where we see our long-term strategy as well. And the importance of that being open source and integrated with actually many of the other systems governments are using which are open source. So things like DHIS2 and OpenMRS, um, other types of national level um, monitoring systems that we're um, actively integrating with. Am I getting a signal that we're out of time? Is that what that signal is? <laughs> Can we take one more question? Okay. Um, my name is Livingstone. I'm from Kampala, Uganda. Uh, let me comment about healthcare from the marketplace angle because I think we might be solving problems, but if the marketplace itself is not functioning, we have a problem on our hands. And this is what we've seen. We built a micropension scheme started onboarding. By the time we crossed a thousand members, they were demanding health. So we wanted to provide them health care insurance. But then it was impossible to provide so because they, they, they are making small contributions, but they have to buy health care insurance in bits of policies for one year. And, and the reason that the insurance companies want their money in advance, so they, you can't insure people that way. So what we found out is that there is quite a disconnect between the health care facilities and the, the companies are providing health insurance, and then the consumers themselves. So if, we, if we're going to be able to serve our clients and open up the healthcare market and collect it, we need to build connections between healthcare, consumers, and, 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 and the insurance companies that are providing it. Thereby, we can be able to kind of re-engineer, re um, reconnect the, the dots in, in between. So we, we think that if people continue to pay from cash out, cash in pocket, and they go to hospital, they don't buy the full doses because they don't have cash, they never planned for that, that's a huge problem. If we depend on the government, the government of Uganda is budgeting $2 per person per year. That is not going to work to be able to, to fix the problem. So I think we need to focus a, pay, a lot of our, our efforts if we're going to solve healthcare on the marketplace. I think that's my comment. While we're doing the mic, I'll, I'll just say thank you for your comment, and uh, I, I agree. I think the exciting thing about healthcare is there are 
so many players, um, and so a lot of different ways you can try to solve things. Also can become a headache sometimes, trying to figure it all out, but um, it's great. Hi, my, my name is Malia, and I'm with Digital Medic, which is a group out of Stanford University. We're also trying to use human-centered design, and my question is around, um, where do you see the greatest need for real education expertise, meaning we, we've created some educational materials um, for different types of learners in different parts of the world and on different topic areas, um, including maternal and child health, mostly in that area in South Africa. So where do you see the greatest need? I'll, I'll say kind of where, where my focus is. And uh, for me, uh, we, we do think a lot about chronic disease because chronic disease uh, is exploding, but also it's something that requires behavior change. And uh, behavior change is the only way that you can effectively manage your disease and also avoid um, a lot of the bad outcomes or, or the disease altogether if you do the behavior change early enough. And uh, so for me, Behavior change uh, requires so many things. Uh, where we start, of course, is with helping people manage their health, but that doesn't create it in itself. Even if you know what your blood sugar level is, uh, you, know, you need to create these feedback loops of awareness, of uh, understanding of what you're doing, and understanding of how that's actually affecting your health, because oftentimes how you feel and the actual outcome you have aren't as closely aligned as you would like. Uh, and so, to me, that is an area that will just increase in importance and education uh, around prevalence, but also how to, how to change your lifestyle, if needed, is a, is a key area. Okay, can I add a very, very quick, you know, thank you for what you're doing, because, you know, you, you're tapping into my passion right now. Because what, you, what, you, what you're speaking to in terms of education, you know, uh, I often say in, in Africa, in most of our country, we don't have health system. That's my personal point of view. We have disease management system. Because speaking to health, it's, it's, it's basic. You know, we're not going to reinvent the, the wheel. You know, tell me what you're eating. I can tell you your health status in the next couple of years. Okay. So we can put in place a health system if we want to. So we've been speaking about disease management system, everything I've been saying, system, this and that, it's a disease management system. But talking about health system, why can't we just put you know, educational materials clear in the entire educational system from the kid from pre-K before end of elementary school where the kids know what is a real like healthy plate? Let's put those material in place. And then if we teach our kid like that before they finish elementary school, we can that generation of kids, we can assure that we can reduce like most of those diseases for, I don't know, 50 or 40%. We can do something ex like extraordinary just by teaching what are the fundamental for health. Just starting from pre-K, before the kids end school. But are we doing that? No. We are heavily on vertical diseases funding where we fight malaria by looking at how much we spend on buying artemisinin or buying mosquito net, while you go to Benin and you walk around the country, you know, all the drainage, the sewage drainage for water, everything is open. Like, everything, like, when it rains, the drainage is completely open all over the country. Talking about mosquito programs, we invest in billions, and we don't talk about that. But we're buying mosquito net, okay? We're buying artemisinin. We have disease management system. So if you're interested in putting in place in Africa, real health system, let's talk, and then I have ideas. Plant-based whole foods, that's what, that's what you're going I had to say that. I'll just add to that, I think Matt mentioned this uh, earlier in terms of community health worker programs are often focused on you know, a really basic set of maternal and child health services, and that's, that's very quickly changing right now. So we're experimenting with HIV self-tests, which are rolling out in Kenya at the moment. Um, seeing an uh, increasing number of family planning services, including injectables, being delivered at the home. Um, malaria rapid diagnostic tests have been happening for a long time at the home, um, but we're putting into place more tools within our tools uh, to help diagnose that more accurately um, and uh, even take snapshots of those tests so that supervisors can be double-checking them later. 
Uh, so there's, I think, a lot of opportunity for the task shifting that's happening to the community level where we could be enhancing community health worker training and reinforcement um, because uh, those consistent in-person trainings are really expensive and they're hard to, to coordinate. So the more reinforcement we can do over devices they're using all the time um, is a big win there. Well, thanks. Thanks, thanks everyone for, for joining us. It's a big room and it's actually a nice group. So thanks for your questions and thanks to the panelists. Thank you.